Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's library workshop about analyzing scholarly literature using bibliometrics. So my name is Hao Yonglan. I'm the engineering library, library at the CMU Libraries. And today, along with me, is Sarah Yang, the social sciences librarian. And here is the evidence synthesis team from the CMU Libraries. So about today's workshop, we will cover several topics. The first one is the definition about the bibliometrics. And the next, we will talk about, talk about some of the types of the research questions about the bibliometrics. And in the next, we will talk about assemble a data set to fit for purpose for your specific like uh, literature review or bibliometrics purposes. And finally, we will introduce some tools for bibliometric analysis. So first thing, what is or are the bibliometrics? According to the bibliometrics coined by the Alan Fritschler in 1969, the bibliometrics is to shed light on the process of written communication and of the nature and course of a discipline by means of counting and analyzing the various facets of written communications. And regarding the bibliometrics methods, it is about doing with quantitative evaluation of scientific articles and other published works, such as the authors of these articles and the journals, the works where it was published, and the number of the times they are later cited. So this is how the bibliometrics were defined in regarding its specific methods. And the bibliometrics also includes some science mapping. So as you can see on the right-hand side, this is a network analysis of the uh, bibliometrics. And it can be used to map the structures and the development of the scientific fields and the disciplines. And in addition, it also produces a spatial representation of the findings. And the purpose is to create a representation of the research area's structure. In the next, we are going to talk about some types of bibliometrics methods. So that involves the citation, co-citation, bibliographic coupling, co-author, and a co-work. So you can see this is a, a table that includes the introduction and also the description and some use cases for these five methods, including the citation, co-citation, bibliographic coupling, co-author, and a co-work. So for example, you can see the citation basically describes the influence of documents, authors, or journals through the citation rates. And the it can quickly find the important works in the field. And uh, it, also the newer publications might have less time to be cited. So therefore the citation might sometimes create bias toward the older publications. And about the co-citation, it connects the documents, authors, or journals on the basis of the joint appearances in the reference lists. So it also has some pros and cons uh, that it is the most used and validated bibliometric methods, and it can connect the documents, authors, or journals with co-citation. However, the co-citation might also be performed on cited articles, so it's not optimal for mapping research fronts. And regarding bibliographic coupling, it connects the documents, authors, or journals on the basis of the number of shared references. So that's basically about the shared references. And it can immediately be available and does not require citations to accumulate. But it can only be used for a limited time frame, for example, up to a five-year interval. And it does not inherently identify the most important works by citation counts as co-citation. And regarding the co-author, it connects the authors when they co-author or co-write the papers. So it can provide evidence for collaboration and produce the social structure of the field. However, collaboration is not always acknowledged with the co-authorship in some cases. And finally, the co-word connects the keywords when they appear in the same title, abstract, or keyword list. So it uses the actual content of the documents for analysis. So that is the pros of the co-word. And on the other hand, the code word or the words can appear in different forms and might have different meanings, which might create confusions. So in this case, all right. 
So in the next, we're going to talk about some types of the research questions that you might encounter. So, so the first example that you might want to answer with the bibliometrics regarding the research questions is the what are the major advances in a field over a time period? So you can see in the uh, bottom side, you can see this is um, a visual network of the scientific profile of brain computer interfaces, and it is conducting a bibliometric analysis in a 10 year period. So you can use the bibliometrics to basically to visually showcase the major advances in the field over the time. And the other question that you might want to um, ask with the bibliometrics is what are the relationships between the keywords or topics? So you can see the below example. So this is about the persistence of high energy burdens and it's using the bibliometric analysis. And on the right hand side, you can see a visual diagram a network analysis connected by the dots, by the nodes and the lines about the relationships between the keywords and topics. And you can see the highlights from this uh, screenshot is that bibliometrics offer a useful tool to uncover evolving patterns of the US energy burden. So you can see uh, the bibliometrics can be uh, powerful to help you uncover many insights from the uh, this certain keywords or topics. The next question that you might want to ask is about the interdisciplinarity. For example, how interdisciplinary is a topic? And you can utilize the bibliometric methods to analyze the interdisciplinary field of a um, certain subject, such as the cultural evolution in this case. And on the right-hand side, you can find a visual diagram, a network analysis of the um, this uh, cultural evolutions in terms of the interdisciplinarity. In addition, there are some emerging algorithms can also help you like utilize the bibliometric uh, analysis to map some like uh, global changes. For example, in this case is to utilize the machine learning to map the climate impacts using bibliometrics. So as you can see here, this is about the machine learning based evidence and attribution mapping of 100K climate impact studies. So you can see this is the, on the right-hand side, you can see the global map that also is broken down by the certain topics regarding the climate impacts. And you can see some bar charts on the upper-hand side to see some um, detailed information about the uh, machine learning-based bibliometrics analysis. And in addition to that, you can also utilize the machine learning to map the landscape of a certain bodies of literatures. And the, this is the bi biomedical literatures in this case. So you can utilize um, the machine learning based bibliometric analysis to analyze the landscape of biomedical research. And on the right hand side, you can see this is the um, two dimensional embedding of the PubMed dataset. So PubMed is a popular data set in the field of the medicine and biomedical engineering. So you can see this is a, like a very visual way to showcase the like a overall landscape and also density of the certain topics in the biomedical fields. And you can see some additional like a diagram about the certain topics in the landscape of biomedical research. And you can see like certain areas are highlighted based on the keywords entered. All right, so in the next, I will um, hand over to Sarah to talk about the rest of the workshop. All right, thank you, Hao Young. I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> and um, so I'm gonna talk about think, um, assembling a data set based on the questions that you intend to answer with your bibliometric study. So Hao Yang just went over some really interesting examples of the way we might apply bibliometrics analysis to the literature, questions that we might ask and answer with that type of approach. Um, and depending on what kind of questions we're asking, um, that's gonna really drive the decisions we make about the type of data that we need for our project. So let's go ahead and think about that. Um, so 
let's talk about what data, first of all, that you need to, to do the analysis. Um, and then secondly, we'll think about what sources or databases provide the best source of this type of data. So we'll just walk through, again, some of the types of um, analyses that you might do in a bibliometric study, um, and then think about the data that would be appropriate for that um, analysis. So one thing that you might be doing is simply looking at public publishing trends over time. Um, in this case, you would need information about the publication year, right? So the, the date when um, a piece of research was published, um, you might need journal titles, for example, if you want to analyze trends related to where the literature is being published, what journals um, a particular topic is being published in. Um, these are two examples of um, graphics, one in K, one a table, one a, a simple um, uh, timeline or scatter plot of number of publications over the years. Um, and so this is the kind of data that you would need to generate these types of graphics for um, your paper. If you are interested in looking at collaboration and co-authorship, um, you need to have good data on author names and perhaps their affiliations. So Sometimes in bibliometrics uh, research, when we think about collaboration, we might think about collaboration at the author level, so um, collaboration between individuals. Um, and in um, other studies, we might be looking at collaboration at the institutional level, so across universities, um, across sectors. Um, and so depending on the types of questions we're asking, uh, we need data associated with those different levels of, um, of authorship. Um, we might also, for example, look at, um, be interested in looking at international collaboration. Um, there's a table here on the left um, that analyzed uh, collaboration across countries. So in that case, we would need good, clean data related to the country locations of authors on a paper. Um, if you're interested in digging more into kind of the topics or different sort of um, research communities associated with a particular body of literature, um, that's when we might get into some of these types of uh, networks that Howe Young mentioned, um, including bibliographic coupling or co-citation networks. And these are networks that really rely on data about references and um, citations. So um, in this case, we would want to have you know, good data on the um, references included in our studies of interest, um, or we might need good data on who is citing the studies in our uh, population of research. So um, again, depending on the type of network that we're developing, uh, we would need to think about you know, whether or not we're looking at sort of references, so those uh, past articles or the articles in the future, the ones citing the articles um, that are going to make up our network. Um, and we'll talk about where we can get data like that in a moment. And these are just some sort of a visualization sort of distinguishing bibliographic coupling from a co-citation network. Um, these are sort of slightly different and might tell us slightly different things about uh, the research communities in a body of, of literature. Um, the graphic here on the left is a um, bibliographic coupling network that has been, um, on which has been applied topic modeling, looking at the different clusters that have been assigned associated with references, uh, patterns, and citation um, to sort of distinguish these different sub-communities within this particular body of literature. Um, another thing that might be interesting to look at in bibliometrics research is sort of influence and impact. So in other words, um, you know, are there particular papers, particular authors that have had um, a specific a you know, particularly um, high level of influence on a body of research over time. Um, and for this, we might look at things like 
citation metrics. So how many times different works in our co um, collection have been cited, or perhaps um, we might look at um, calculate some, some network statistics like um, degree centrality or betweenness centrality. These are just network, um, sort of social network statistics that we can use to understand the influence of particular actors in a network, in this case, authors um, in a co-authorship network, um, and sort of to understand their importance in, um, you know, again, sort of generating research on a topic. And again, some examples of these approaches here. Uh, and then Hao Yang showed some really interesting examples of the use of machine learning and topic modeling for within bibliometrics approaches. Um, and when we get into that, we really want sort of the text um, or the sort of the textual content of the bibliographic records. And so this might be titles and abstracts. Um, it might be the key words that authors have assigned to their papers, or um, in some cases, you might be digging into the full text of articles. Um, so again, thinking about these as your data sources for this type of analysis. So once you've identified what type of data or what actual um, data you need to do the analyses that you want to do and answer the questions you're asking, um, you want to think about the sources of those data and what are the best sources um, for that particular um, set of data that you need. And most of this is going to come from databases, um, in some cases, subscription library databases that you would access through CMU libraries. Um, in others, it might make sense to make use of open um, available data through free sources like OpenLX. Um, so let's sort of dig into this a little bit. You know, before we do that, um, I just want to note, you know, if you are looking at doing some full text, um, sort of text mining types of analyses, um, we do also through CMU libraries have a couple of um, platforms that allow you to analyze full text of large uh, bodies of literature, even newspaper content and other types of um, you know, maybe con congressional records, for example, other types of um, documents um, in these different platforms. And then there are ways of potentially accessing full text through um, some free sources as well. So in terms of considering to, um, which databases to, to think about or which sources of data to think about, um, you want to consider coverage. So um, if you are looking at, say, trends going back um, over time, you want to have a good understanding of how, um, you know, how much in the past a, a particular database covers, um, where that coverage begins and ends. Um, thinking about the completeness of the metadata. So, for example, um, if you're doing an analysis that involves affiliation data, um, you want to make sure you're choosing a database that has the best, most complete data of affiliations for authors um, as possible. Um, for example, you may find that some databases only provide affiliation data for the first author, um, which is not going to be useful if you're doing a co-authorship analysis at the affiliation level, and you really want, you know, authorship or affiliation data um, for all of an all of the authors on a paper. Uh, consistency and sort of cleanness or tidiness of the data. Um, this is definitely going to vary from source to source and also from um, data type to data type. So for example, uh, publication year and um, is, is you know a data, a piece of data that is going to be consistent um, and clean and sort of easy to work with. But when you get into things like author names or affiliation data, you're definitely going to be dealing with a lot of um, variation um, in terms of the way you know a given author's name is represented or a different or a given affiliation is represented, even within the same database. So um, these are things to consider um, in terms of the kind of work that you'll need to do um, to prepare your data for analysis. Um, accuracy, of course, um, you're looking for sources that are giving you, you know, good, accurate data. 
Um, and then finally, thinking about access. So um, in most cases for bibliometrics analysis, um, you're gonna be downloading data from these sources uh, and then doing the analysis in, in a different software. Um, so thinking about what are the export features, what are the formats that um, data can be exported in, and are there limitations in the amount of data that you can export from these sources? Um, this is, these are just things that you want to consider when you're thinking about the source of the data for your, your project. So in um, taking steps to gather your data set, um, you want to think about whether or not you're going to need to use um, data from multiple sources and how you might go about combining data across sources. Um, can you rely you know, simply on a single database like Scopus or Web of Science, or might you need to do searches across numerous databases to have a more complete picture of the literature on a topic, for example? Um, in terms of how do you go about finding that um, data or assembling that data set in these databases, you want to think about the search strategy uh, that you're applying. So are you attempting to be comprehensive around a particular um, topic? Are you possibly relying on the database's own um, indexing around you know, subject categories, for example? Um, you know, how are you going to construct and bring that data set together? And how do you export your data for further analysis? So what formats are you going to be exporting your data in, in terms of you know, where you're moving, what software you're moving into for the analysis phase of your project? All right, so with that, I'm going to move on to sort of some of the tools. You know, we talked a little bit about um, you know, the analysis and the types of data that you need and the types of formats that you need. But let's talk about what tools you might actually use once you've assembled this data set and you're moving into your analysis phase. Um, there's many, many tools out there for bibliometrics analysis. And depending on um, what you're doing and you know what amount of um, sort of customization you need to do, um, that's going to depend and it's going to sort of inform the, the tools that you decide to use. Um, and I've sort of grouped these into four different categories, and we'll take a look at examples of each. But we might consider um, web-based tools, um, platform-based tools, tools for citation analysis, and tools for network analysis. So uh, we're going to take each of these in turn and provide some examples. So web-based tools here, I'm just referring to those that are kind of the user-friendly uh, point-and-click websites that uh, provide quick interactive visualizations based on usually sort of an input of one or more um, seed articles. So you might give it, um, you know, these different applications. You might just give it a sort of a seminal article in a, in a body of research and it will generate a graphic that you can interact with to see um, who has cited that work, um, how that work is connected to other work, um, and sort of explore just within the web-based tool um, this different information. Generally speaking, these aren't going to be useful for generating your own analyses, um, calculating network statistics, or um, generating your own custom graphics for a paper, but they will be useful just for exploration purposes and you know, are really designed probably more in some cases for research discovery. Um, so sort of looking, you know, using say a set of seed articles or a seminal work to find other works that might be of interest um, in your, your research. Um, so here's a few examples that you can sort of explore. Um, that do this kind of thing. Um, similarly, there are other tools that are kind of built into these more sophisticated databases. Um, in particular, Web of Science and Dimensions um, are two databases, again, that you would access largely through the library's um, subs subscriptions. Um, and these are really pretty comprehensive databases of scholarly literature that also include 
um, data about, you know, fairly good data about authorship, affiliation, and citation information. So here you can explore within these tools, um, you know, run a search about a body of literature, a research topic, and then go in and do some, you know, sort of your essentially constrained by the analyses that these have already set for you, but you can look at um, publications over time, publications by subject, um, top authors, um, top cited work, and, and that sort of thing. Again, this is really probably less so for, you know, publication ready kinds of graphics that you would be putting into a bibliometric study of your own um, and more for exploration and discovery. Um, but I just wanted to point out that these kind of use, you know, bibliographic methods and visualizations um, within these tools. Now, when you are actually doing your own bibliometrics research, um, this is where we get into actual software that you would use on exported data from the data sources that we've talked about. Um, so for example, um, VosViewer, SciMat, Bibliometrics, these are all tools um, that can uh, allow you to analyze a data set that you've exported from another um, source like a Web of Science or Scopus. Um, these will provide visualizations um, and other types of analyses that you can do um, to answer some of those questions that we've talked about earlier in this presentation. And finally, you know, we've alluded a bit to network analysis, and this is kind of um, another level of um, sort of bibliometrics kinds of approaches that uh, you can use to look at connections between papers. Again, this is largely in bibliometrics going to be about co-authorship, um, collaboration, but also things like we talked about bibliographic coupling and citation networks. Um, and here you can actually use um, software that is specifically designed for social network analysis like Gephi, PayJack, and iGraph. Um, and these are gonna give you sort of a more sophisticated uh, level of analysis for networks, understanding, you know, doing network, network statistics, for example, and more um, complex or advanced network visualizations. So um, these, I would say, have a higher learning curve than the ones on the previous slide that are really more specifically designed for bibliometrics data, um, but these can be um, sort of an interesting approach um, depending on the, again, the questions that you're asking in your, your study. So with that, um, I just wanna note that, you know, we are here to support bibliometrics types of research projects. Um, we can certainly help with um, these projects in a number of ways through consultation and collaboration. We actually have two services in the library that, um, can support this kind of work. One is at the Evidence Synthesis Service. This is a service that is designed to provide expertise and support with um, evidence synthesis, such as systematic reviews, scoping reviews, systematic maps, um, some of which you know, may um, include bibliometrics um, approaches. So um, that's one service to keep in mind. Um, and our research metric service is also available to help um, with any projects related to measuring research impact, um, either, you know, again, at the author or institutional level, um, or looking, again, more broadly at a, a body of research using bibliometrics methods. So between these two services, we are here to help with um, these kinds of projects. There's a number of great resources out there um, for learning more about bibliometrics research. Um, and I've included a few here um, that might be useful. Uh, and we will provide, the, there, there's a link to these slides um, in the description of this presentation on the, the YouTube page so you can get to these more easily. Uh, and then finally, just a reminder, we have many, um, live, both in-person and virtual workshops through the libraries, um, and then more content on our YouTube page um, with some of our workshop material as well. So please do check those out. 
And then with that, um, we thank you for um, being here and for um, learning more about this kind of work. And we look forward to hearing you through our um, services.